We meet many people in a lifetime. Some we see often and understand a little. Others we know hardly at all. Stop a moment and think. How little we know about the lives, the motives, the hopes and fears of the people around us. People are different. Each has his own life story, his own memories and ambitions. People are alike too in many ways, if we study them. One way to study people is through reading. In the books and stories we read, we can learn about people and ourselves. In novels especially, we can begin to understand why people behave as they do. Walt has been assigned a novel to read. As we read along with him, we can learn something of how to read novels. Silas Marner by George Eliot, a novel of long ago. Before we read the novel itself, let's learn a little about the author. Who was George Eliot? George Eliot was a woman who lived in Victorian England. We can imagine her in her study. Marion Evans, for that was her real name, wrote book reviews and helped edit various London magazines. She also wrote novels under the pen name of George Eliot. In a letter to a friend, she wrote, I am writing a story which came across my other plans by a sudden inspiration. It is extremely unlike the popular stories going. It is a story of old-fashioned village life. In such a village, George Eliot had spent her childhood. The story of Silas Marner takes place in the village of Raveloe, which the author tells us was never reached by the vibrations of the coach horn or of public opinion. A village shut off from the outside world, one where ignorance led to superstition and fear. A village largely made up of farmers who needed only a few craftsmen, such as the weaver, to supply their needs. Such a village George Eliot knew as a child. It is the setting for the story of Silas Marner. Knowing something about the author, being able to picture the setting, these help us understand a novel, any novel. Thus, by visualizing the coast of Maine, we may better enjoy the novel Mary Peters by Mary Ellen Chase. Here, where the quiet, picturesque farmland competes with the wild sea for the lives of the people, the story of Mary Peters is torn and tossed between sea and land. London is the setting we should bear in mind when we read many of Charles Dickens' novels. More recently, John Galsworthy has written novels in which these settings are important. Or we must imagine the Mississippi River and its steamers if we are to appreciate fully many of the stories of Mark Twain. And an English village, much like this one, is the setting for Silas Marner. As we read, we shall keep the setting in mind, for in the setting, and partly because of it, the story takes place. The first person we meet in the story is Silas Marner himself. Those large brown protuberant eyes in Silas Marner's pale face really saw nothing very distinctly. Can we picture this man? Can we guess how he might have looked Brown, protuberant eyes, pale face. Think of such a man whom we have seen. Then begin to imagine how Silas Marner looked. Meet him, as we do in the novel, a man alone, set off from the other villagers, at whose approach the shepherd's dog barked fiercely. Even the shepherd himself was not quite sure that this trade of weaving, 
indispensable though it was, could be carried on entirely without the help of the evil one. Yes, by picturing in our minds the persons described by the author, we help make a story come to life. Often, as in Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, it is important to understand the character of a whole community of people, a people amongst whom religion and law were almost identical, so that the mildest and the severest acts alike were made venerable and awful. Here we have a setting and characters for a grim story of puritanical morality. In other novels, such as Cooper's The Deerslayer, one central character is the key to the story. Meet Hurry Harry, as described by James Fenimore Cooper, both good-humored and handsome, a man whose air was free, though his manner necessarily partook of the rudeness of a border life. Unless you picture this man, you cannot fully enjoy the story. So it is we approach novels, finding out about the author, imagining the setting, meeting the characters, and picturing them. This takes time, and most novels are not read all at once. When we stop, we should think back over what we have read before we put the book aside. When we have another chance to read further, we first recall the people and the situations they were in when we last put down the book. In Silas Marner, we have a story set in a remote English village. We know something about the main character, a lonely weaver of whom the townsfolk are suspicious. As we read further, we learn that Silas Marner is a miser his only friends are the gold and silver coins he keeps hidden beneath the floor of his cottage. This is the way George Eliot describes the scene. How the guineas shone as they came pouring out of the dark leather mouths. He spread them out in heaps and bathed his hands in them. Then he counted them and set them up in regular piles and felt their rounded outline between his thumb and fingers. Thus we come to know Silas Marner. Of course there are other people in the novel. One is Dunstan Cass, of whom the author tells us that his taste for swapping and betting might turn out to be a sowing of something worse than wild oats. Dunstan needed money, and one day on a sudden impulse, he decided to borrow some from Silas. What happened at the cottage? Let the author tell us. The door opened, and he found himself in front of a bright fire, which lit up the cottage. Marner was not there. What Dunstan does next tells us more, much more, about his character. He needs money. The cottage is deserted. In the author's words, the pressing question, where is the money, now took entire possession of him. Thus, by picturing the characters in the setting, and with events happening to them, we begin to understand these characters. We begin to know them more intimately, than we know persons we see every day. After we are well into a story, we can often enrich our reading by discussing it with others. The comments of our friends may change our own ideas and help us see the people and events of the story in a new light. Sometimes we are asked to prepare a more formal discussion a book report. When we are planning to make book reports, we read more carefully. We watch for clues that build up the characters and plot. We are alert for good writing. And we also notice things that are not so good. What goes into a book report? A written report may be brief or long. 
It may discuss parts of a book, some interesting character or incident, or the book as a whole. Oral reports can be especially interesting. A small group can give a book chat. Or you may want to tell the class yourself what you have gained from reading a novel. If you have read it well, your job is easy. What you have learned about the author may be part of your report. How you picture the setting of the novel. What you think of the main character. And then you may tell about one exciting event in the story so that others will want to read the novel and meet the people you have come to know. Dunstan has gone, taking the money with him. Silas has returned. He is thinking about the roast of pork he has been given. Such a miser would never have bought it for himself. What will happen? When will Marner discover his loss? Now that we understand something about the author, the setting, the characters, we are better able to enjoy this tense, exciting moment in the novel.